please give a massive round of applause and a welcome to General Stanley McChrystal. Thank you so much. There's been some breaking news today. According to Sky News this morning, a Russian jet, an SU-24, if that means something to you, uh, has been shot down over allegedly violating Turkish airspace near the Syrian border. The pilot was warned 10 times before being shot down by two Turkish F-16 jets. We've got Putin saying that this is a, a serious act. How significant, sir, do you think that is? Yeah, I think it's potentially very significant. If, if you say, of course, a Russian jet shot down, it's numerically or objectively doesn't matter very much. But one, they had been having this friction and the, the Turks had been warning. And so it looks to me like Turkey just finally said, OK, enough. Now, what this does is when we think about uh, grand strategy or international politics or, or all these sorts of things, we think in grand movements. But really, it's people. And so now what is involved is Putin. And he's a very real person. And he's got an ego. And he's got all of these things that we all have. And he's had a plane shot down, which is sort of poking him in the eye. There's going to be an emotional response. Wars begin because people have grand national objectives. They continue because people have killed people's friends and brothers, and they get their own energy to it. So to me, this has a great opportunity to create the kind of uh, outsized friction, much greater than the loss of a plane or even two human beings, uh, between Turkey and Russia. They may work through it, and I hope that they do, but uh, I, I would be very, I am very concerned, and I suspect everyone here is. Putin is saying that they weren't over, um, yeah. you know, uh, the Turkish airspace, the Syrian, and so obviously Turkey is part of NATO. So is that where quickly an IS situation could become a global situation? Well, it does, and whether they were over Turkish airspace is sort of academic because right. they weren't mistaken for anything. ISIS doesn't have airplanes. Uh, Syrian jets aren't going into Turkey, so I guess mm. the Turks, I would guess, absolutely knew who they were shooting. They were warning yeah. the pilot, so yeah. it was yeah. a conscious decision to shoot him down. Yeah, it's very hard, isn't it, to know whether it's uh, premeditated on part of the Russians or whether it was a bit of ego on part of the Turks saying, get out my space, you're not listening. We should... Maybe, both. Maybe both. Remember, that's how these things happen. We always think, and somebody will write a history book later and they'll forget it was the personal part of this. But one of the things I learned in life, it's so much about how people feel. We can cover uh, yeah. some of the current affairs yeah. later, and I know there will be certainly questions Please. from the floor on that. Um, but my job today is to speak to you about leadership, your amazing career. You once said, I've been soldiering as long as I have been shaving. What is it that you miss the most? This is sort of a just quick fire. Yeah, well you, well, you were very kind, and I thought I'd just you know, go on and talk. Um, I left the military in 2010 <laughs> when a uh, controversial article came out in the uh, Rolling Stone magazine, so anybody can ask me about it, I'm fine with it. Um, I was 17 when I entered the military. I was 55 when this article came out, and as soon as I read the article, I knew, okay, I was going to have to offer my resignation because it created this media firestorm. Now, I thought that the article was inaccurate. What do you mean? I knew the article was inaccurate, but that doesn't matter. You know, a lot of inaccurate articles written about people. And it was one guy's view, and it created this, this civilian military tension. And so I offered the president my, my resignation. I, there was no doubt about it, no hesitation in doing that, and no regrets that I haven't done it. Regret that the article came out. I canceled my subscription to Rolling Stone. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, everyone in your life, and we can talk about it more in CUNA if you want, everyone in your life is going to have some failure. And that was a failure for me. Whether I thought it was, whether I was guilty or not, doesn't matter. You have things that don't work out as you want them to, and you're going to have to deal with it. And how I dealt with this shaped the rest of my life. I'm very happy how I dealt with it, but I hadn't thought about it beforehand. I didn't have a game plan. I completely did it in reaction because it was so unexpected and it was so different. You know, I've told people before, I thought in my career I might get killed. I thought I might get fired for incompetence, but I never thought I'd be accused of being disloyal ever. And so suddenly it was this out-of-body experience where you're reading about yourself in the newspaper, you're seeing the ticker on the TV, you know your son is in college is watching that, think how painful that is. My 86-year-old father's watching that, think how painful that is. Um, so how you process that and how you react becomes a defining moment. And um, my decision, helped by my wife, 
who always looks forward, never looks back, uh, has been to focus on the future and just not spend a lot of time worrying about it. And I'm really happy I did that. So a Rolling Stones presenter or journalist came along. Uh, you let them in because you were in Paris at the time. as part of your belief in just open communications. Right. And he picked up some of your guys having some banter and basically turned it into this massive thing. For my, my impression of reading that was just the president, um, and he's made some wrong decisions. I'm always sure he's made some good ones, but that was one of those wrong ones, in my opinion. Yeah, I might be biased on this particular <laughs> issue. But, but in the context, remember, there was this political feeling in the U.S. at the time that the, the generals are pressuring the president. So you have to put it against that backdrop. I'm sure he's, he's got a certain number of people tell him, don't let the generals push you around. Well, I wasn't trying to push him around, but... But you have to understand that context. So yeah. I'm a little more sympathetic to yeah. the difficulty okay. that he had to face with that. You, when you graduated in 1976, you went all the way to the top. Um, what were some of the personal attributes that you had that enabled you to rise up and get so far? Yeah, of course, as most of the people in this room would admit, there's a healthy dose of luck. A lot of good people start. You've got peers and some self-select out because they don't have the talent or the drive and some just aren't lucky. And so the fact, the idea that I think in my year group or my class from West Point, two of us made four-star general, or three of us, I'm sorry, three. We were not the three best people out of the 1,476 who started my class. I mean, we don't kid ourselves that. There were a lot of good people. But there were some things that I found useful. One is, as I started my uh, service as a young lieutenant, you do have to care. You can't fake that. You can fake it for a little while, but with soldiers, you can't fake it forever. If you don't really care about soldiers, they, they can feel it pretty quickly. And you're not going to enjoy the job anyway. So I was just lucky that I happened to find that real comfortable. You have to be personally disciplined, too. There's a lot of things about leadership. We could all sit here and say, what are the attributes of a good leader? What are the behaviors of good leadership? And we'd get the list about the same. The big difference is who actually does it. And if you think about it, Every day, we, we know what kind of leader we want. We get up in the morning, we do whatever, and we go off, and we start interacting with people. And we know what a good leader is, most of us. And then you have interactions with people, and some of them you do very well, this is my case, and some of them I don't do very well. I treat people incorrectly or, or that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, I sit there and I go, wow, I had 200 interactions today, and I got five of them wrong, but that's five people who I are probably never going to meet me again, and I just got it wrong, and I missed that opportunity. And so the discipline to say, okay, five's not okay. Right. I, I got to stay at it. And it's other things in, in whatever business you're in. The discipline to either study what you have to study, listen when you need to listen, because when you get powerful, it's interesting. There aren't a lot of people around to tell you no. Hmm. And so as a consequence, if you throw a little tantrum, nobody goes... That was ridiculous because you're the boss. If you cut a corner, in fact, what people will do, you'll say, well, if it's not okay if I cut this corner and do this, you'll have people around you going, no, it's okay, and they'll rationalize it for you. Uh, there used to be big visits by senior leaders to military units that I was in, and they would stack the schedule up so much that it was almost impossible. And then mid-afternoon, mid the, the, the leader would say, well, sir, we're, or somebody would tell the leader, we're falling behind. And the leader would go, is it okay if we cancel the last two hours of the visit? And someone goes, oh, yes, sir, it's, ab it's absolutely right. It's, it's a good thing to do, no problem. Well, there were a whole bunch of soldiers that spent several days preparing for that visit. They've either got a demonstration or they've got something they're going to show you. They've practiced a briefing, and then they get call they've been preparing for days. They get a call that says, the senior leader's not coming. And they just are, they didn't like doing it, but they even hate preparing and then having the senior leader signal they're not important enough. And the senior leader doesn't think about it. And so I used to tell guys as they got more senior that they become dinosaurs. Not old, but you get huge and your brain doesn't get bigger, but you have this huge tail. And you turn and this tail knocks stuff over and you don't even know it. And, and the secret is not forgetting you have a tail and also surrounding yourself with people who keep reminding you, you got a tail. There's an unintended consequence to what you're doing. Yeah. Or not doing. Who, who, who was that person? Because I imagine it, you know, you're, you're the top guy. I mean. Yeah. In, in the military, we've got a great structure. We've got a thing called sergeant's major. And once you're a battalion commander, about 600 guys or above, 
you have a, a counterpart who's the command sergeant major of the unit. Mm -hmm. And they're typically about your age at that point. And so they've grown up about the same time as you. And he, that sergeant major is junior to every second lieutenant in the unit but they're really senior to everybody except the commander because they have this informal positional power. And if they're the right personality, I had a number of sergeants major, but one I served with a number of times in my career, particularly in, in Afghanistan, my call. He became my friend, my partner, my conscience, my, you know, he's the person who could sit in there and go, hey, that's BS, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, don't do that. Um, and, and that, you have to have that. Yeah. Um, and if you don't find it in the organization, you have to create it. Uh, you have to find somebody able to, I did, yeah. find somebody able yeah. to do that. In fact, I think that's one thing from all the business leaders we've interviewed. They've always got somebody out there, maybe outside of the organization or an executive, who was able to say that is BS, as you say. Yeah. So if we can just pick up on one of your yeah. points there. As you said, you're not used to being told what to do. But there's a quote that says, he who has never learned to obey can never be a good commander. What would happen if you, for example, got a, an order in from the, your boss, the president of the United States of America, um, that you didn't agree with? Yeah. The first thing to do is to learn that following is very, very important. And sometimes you don't have the full contextual understanding of your boss. And so you've got to give them a certain amount of uh, understanding. I think a, a senior leader or any leader at a level, if you get an order that you think is stupid or wrong, if it's illegal or immoral, that's different. Then that's, that's a thing to refuse to do it and resign. But if it's, you don't get many of those, you tend to get orders that are not very smart or not very thought out, that sort of thing. And so when you get one of those, our systems require that you provide what we call best military advice. That means you're supposed to go back and say, listen, I don't think that's a very good idea. If I were you, I'd order me to do this instead. Now that sounds good, and, and in many cases that's what we do. But I'll tell you what, as you get senior and you start dealing with presidents and whatnot, the atmosphere in the room doesn't always encourage that. You know, it's sometimes intentionally and sometimes not. And so when I was sent to Afghanistan in the summer of 2010, they just relieved my predecessor and they decided they wanted to change. And they told me, okay, you're going to go over to Afghanistan and do this. I went over to see the president and I had about three minutes with him. You know, the Secretary of Defense takes me over and he, they go and they take a picture and the president goes, nice to meet you, you know, kind of good luck. And I walked out, I said, that's, that's it. You know, I'm about to, to command a war, your, your war and whatnot. And in retrospect, what I should have done, I should have given him a piece of paper and a pencil. And I should have said, write what you want me to do in Afghanistan. Don't have your staff write it, don't have me write it and approve it. You write it, I'll wait. And if he couldn't write it, then maybe he shouldn't send me yet. Maybe we, you know. And then if he writes it, if I understand it, I said, okay, I got it. That's exactly what I'll do. The reality was when you go off and you're not absolutely synced with what your boss wants, then you start challenges. You're known for leading from the front. You know, uh, we, we interview business leaders and their front is often the, the checkouts and the retail. So it's a little bit different to yours. Um, but in that annoying Rolling Stones article, it said he, that's you, sir, um, went out on dozens of nighttime raids during his time in Iraq, unprecedented for a top commander, and turned up on missions unannounced with almost no entourage. The effing lads love Stanley McChrystal, says a British officer. So why was that so important from a leadership perspective? And was it just because you were a bit of an adrenaline junkie, sir? Yeah. <laughs> um, I went on one op with 2-2 SAS. They worked with me. And we go into the, uh, the briefing, and the commander says, so the squadron commander says, okay, here's what we're going to do. And I'm going to go along. And I'm not much help. I mean, I'm going, I'm, I'm carrying a weapon, and if we get in a fight, I'm going to be fighting, but I'm not real help. And they desperately like me to come and desperately don't want me to get hurt on their raid. But we get there, and he does it, and then he goes, okay, the sergeant major is now going to tell us the plan so you know what to do, briefing the whole troop. And it's a Scotsman, and he gives about a 15-minute brief, and I didn't understand a word. <laughs> and then we're getting, okay, we're getting on the helicopters again. I'm going to get killed, and I have no <laughs> idea. But, you know, going out was what had nothing to do with, you know, liking to, to be out at night or getting shot at or anything. It, it's got several reasons. The first is you have to know what's going on out front. You have to see it and feel it. 
because even though we could watch it from the Predator, which is full motion video or, or hear reports, unless you go, you don't know what's hard, you don't know what's easy, you don't get a feel for it. And so I went out, that was the first reason. The second reason is the guys need you, they need to know you're willing to do that. They need to know you're willing to put yourself at risk. And uh, again, I'm, I'm not a big contributor, but sort of coin of the realm in that kind of organization, just to get basic respect, you gotta be willing to do certain things. And so that, but it, but it gets you so much. I mean, I didn't have to be a brilliant commander because I wasn't, I didn't have to do that kind of thing perfectly. If I was willing to do some other things, I get an awful lot of uh, leeway from the guys yeah. for other stupid stuff I might do. Right, okay. Well, whatever you did right, was they, they, they effing love you. I'm sure they don't swear in the army or something. Um, but did you, just out of interest, you've been in special ops, you know, right from the very beginning. Did you, just a personal question, did you still feel nervous when you got on these things? I mean, is it, you have to sort of, you know, pick up that courage and deal with the self-talk? Yeah, if anybody tells you that they're not nervous when they're out on an op, then, you know, that I don't right. think they're being truthful. So you are. The, it, this is interesting, though, that the great advantage of being a more senior guy, a sergeant or an officer, is you're so focused on the mission, you can't think much about yeah. you. The person I just have huge respect for is the private, because the private's out there, they're doing their mission, and they don't have all the other responsibilities at whatever, so they got a lot of time to think about bullets coming their way and that sort of thing. And it takes huge courage, and you got to have an awful lot of admiration for him. Is that something, courage, something you can be, I and mean, we try and get courage in the civilian world, in the business, and we're always thinking, why can't they take more risk? Is it something that can be acquired, or are you born with that slightly extra yeah. quotient of courage? It's a great question. Um, I think that you can learn a lot of courage. I think you do learn from example. Um, I think you learn an awful lot of how to conduct yourself, not just in physical danger, but also in moral danger. Those cases where it's easier to make a, a wrong decision than to stand up for what's right. I think if you watch that enough from leaders around you that you pick it up. There are some right. people who seem not to, but the vast majority, I think, do. Yeah. Talking about those tough decisions that you have to make, you were accredited for wiping out Abu Musab al-Zakawi uh, in AQI. Um, but at the time, and he was dressed in women's clothes, he was going around different cars, it must have been an absolute nightmare, but you, you got there. At the time, you knew when you ordered that airstrike that the, there was a high likelihood that the family was going to be yeah. in that house. Yeah. Was, did that make it a tough call for you? It, it made it a painful call, but not a difficult call. Right. This is a guy who had killed thousands of innocent Iraqis. He killed a bunch of my people. And, and, I mean, this guy was a, a psychopathic killer, but a very competent one. So anything it took to kill him, I didn't have to think very long. We did. I couldn't guarantee, but I was very confident his family and kids were, or his wife and kids were in there. But it's just, you just you process it and you go, yeah. you have to take a macro look. Yeah. If he'd gotten away, a lot more people would have died. So, uh, yeah. if you can just explain to us when you arrived in Iraq in two thousand and three, yeah. uh, it was a very different uh, sort of enemy, I suppose, that you were expecting to be fighting. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about that epiphany moment when you realized, my God, this isn't what we thought it was? Really went in several stages. I had been in Afghanistan, as you mentioned, and then I went back and I was in the Joint Staff in the Pentagon during the invasion of Iraq, which was March and April. And you remember everybody, whether you thought it was a good idea to invade Iraq, I didn't uh, at the time or not. It looked like it was going to be easy. We got Saddam Hussein out pretty quickly. Then it started to go bad over the summer, but from afar in the Pentagon, you couldn't tell exactly. You're getting reports, but you couldn't tell. I got to Iraq in October, and as soon as I got on the ground, I said, oh my God, this is much, much worse than I thought. You could feel it. And the coalition effort uh, across the coalition was really unimpressive. Um, there were good people, and they were trying hard, but it was this short tours, lack of alignment on a function. It was really, I don't want to, I don't want to be too pejorative, but it was kind of amateur hour. And you go, wait a minute, this is going to be very difficult. And so when I got into my command, and we're spread around the country with the mission of going after what we call high-value targets or HVTs, key leaders, we're supposed to capture or kill those guys. So we got about 15 or 16 bases around Iraq, and we go out and police them up when we get intel. Um, we thought that 
if we went and took Saddam Hussein and the deck of cards, his crony leaders out, that the problem would go away. Now, already by the fall of 2003, that you could question that, that uh, presumption because we were starting to see terrorist things that didn't look like they were done by old Iraqi generals. But at the time, sort of the public face was, this was a bunch of dead-enders, I think was the word used. We didn't talk about terrorists, we didn't talk about insurgents. So we're in denial. But we're gonna go after these people and we do that. And then it became pretty obvious, in a, and we captured Saddam Hussein in December. By the last week of December, it was pretty obvious that there was a terrorist network there. And it was Abu Musab al-Zarqari, who we were familiar with from previous things that he'd done. And so the first thing we did was look for a terrorist network. And I won't say every terrorist network looks the same, but if we had a whiteboard here, I'd draw out a hierarchical network with a pyramid shape. And that would be about right. And it would have very strict discipline because they need it to protect themselves. It would have very carefully controlled communications methods because that's where they're vulnerable when they communicate, you intercept it. And many of the people wouldn't know each other because there'd be what we call cutouts. And so the way you I understand one of these is you draw it on a whiteboard or slides or whatever, and you start to fill in the names. And you don't go capture and kill right away. You start filling it in, looking for connections, monitoring phones, capturing some people so you can ask them connections. But you fill it out, and then when you start to think you've got enough of it, you start taking it apart. You start dismantling it. And as you dismantle it, parts of it have to move to survive, and they become more vulnerable when they move to survive. So you get them there. And you start to, it starts to implode. Um, there is this theory that says if you get Mr. Big, you know, the hierarchical you know, decapitation. But I never believed in that, and it doesn't work anyway, because there's always somebody to replace him. But anyway, that's what you do. But what we saw, and it was so interesting, is we started drawing that out, looking for that, and that's what we're going to defeat. But that's not what we saw in evidence, because this organization is disciplined, focused, but ponderous, because to maintain that kind of discipline and all, they can't operate fast. And so they do something, and then they don't do anything for a while because it takes a while to plan again, and then they, they do that. We weren't seeing that. We're seeing boom, boom, boom around the country, and we're seeing this network connections, and we're seeing them learn from what happens in one place to another instantaneously. And if we took somebody off the battlefield, Instead of it being a, a wrenching reorganization on their part, they sort of organically just reconnected and just moved. And it's the damnedest thing. You're looking at this thing and you go, that's amazing. How are they doing that? They got to be really, really good. And they were good, but they weren't that good. And so then you said, well, why did this happen? Why is this the case? And this is really the whole thesis of the book that, that we wrote. The case was that they were the first terrorist group to emerge after the information age had really come home. Before, we were limited by physics. We were limited by movement physically, but also movement of information. And they were too. And so as a consequence, they did what they had to do the way they had to do it. Suddenly, when we had been empowered by technology and network-centric warfare, we sort of assumed that they hadn't. But they had. We had a lot more stuff than them. We had UAVs, we had Predator, our uh, night vision, we had precision strike weapons, we had GPS, they didn't have that stuff. But they had cell phones and internet. So suddenly, without a plan to do this, they just grew into this network, this constantly shifting, constantly repairing, constantly refocusing network, led by Zarqawi with a disciplined alignment on the objective, but a very decentralized approach to execution. So they could act autonomously, but they, they were constantly informing each other about what was happening. And it made them really, really good. And it made them really deadly and really fast and very different from us. Because we're very, very good, but at the end of the day, we're a hierarchy. We still, we got the habits from all the years that we've been doing things. And so as a consequence, what we find is this thing you know, this sort of circus-like you know, thing that we didn't want to take seriously. They're beating us, and they're beating us pretty well for about two years, two and a half years, defeating us because they're operating differently. And 
if you, we can talk about it later, if you think of Al-Qaeda as Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was 2.0. They were now information age enabled, different beast. ISIS is 3.0. They've taken the lessons of AQI, ramped them up in, in a different manifestation. And we'll see a 4.0 before long. So it's, it's basically the, just the reason why Twitter and Uber have been successful is because it's the same reason why ISIS has been successful. That's exactly so right. It was, there was a quote here from uh, Washington Times, July 2013, 2010. Your organization, your organization was 17 times more effective than it was before. So some of the key ways you did that, empowering decision making, right? Exactly. You were woken up in the middle of the night quite a lot of times yeah. for decisions and then... Yeah. The first thing I want to say is um, I get credited with a lot of things that I don't deserve credit for. Um, what I did in JSOC was, and, and my big, and, I, and I'm proud of it, I don't want to minimize, I do, I'm proud of this. When I got there, I said, we're going to lose this war if we don't change. So my role as the commander was to put my hands on this unit and start pushing it. I couldn't tell it had, what it had to be. I just didn't have that, vi that vision. It was way too murky, but I knew that the status quo we were going to lose. So I sort of put my shoulder against it and, you know, brute force and ignorance. That was what I did. The organization then figured out how to do it. The, I said, we're going to have to move. We're going to have to become different. You guys help figure this out. And so the brains of the organization completely transformed us. Now, what we really did was before we had this hierarchical organization, but inside it, we had silos. We had silos for intelligence, for logistics and whatnot. But our units were siloed, Delta Force, the SEALs, the Rangers. They were these self-contained entities that wanted to operate pure and alone. Just give me a task and stay out of my way. But you can't win a war like that because you're, you're networked across the country and the enemy's constantly shifting. You have to be the same. But you have these institutional and cultural resistances to do that. They just don't want to talk to each other. They don't want to share information. They want to, you know, provide intelligence. They don't want to share assets, you know, helicopters or unmanned aerial vehicles, which... And so we were held up by our own culture and, and processes and habits. We were much less than the sum of our parts because we actually were so damn inefficient. We were very effective when we executed. But when I took over, we were doing four raids a month. Two years later, we were doing 300 raids a month. And the difference was some steps that we took. The first was I started pulling pieces out of the different organizations so they couldn't be self-sufficient. They, they were like a chair without enough legs, and so they had to partner. The second was we, we pursued this idea, which we now call shared consciousness. And what, what it was was everybody knew their part of what was happening, and they would have a narrow view. And, it's one thing to have a narrow view for your task, but if you don't know the bigger picture, you're sort of the blind man with the elephant. You're touching the, the leg or the tusk or the tail, and you have a different conclusion. It's like trying to put together a big jigsaw puzzle when you, there's no picture. You have no idea what the picture is supposed to look like. And so they're, they're working hard, but they're very ineffective in that way. So the first thing we did was to create shared consciousness was start sharing information. We started this dramatic change in democratizing information flow. And this is a top secret organization. So our culture screams against that. You know, that old need to know saying, you know, you don't have a need to know. The problem is, who knows who has a need to know? You know, more than once we'd be about to launch on a raid to go get some guy, and the CIA would call and go, that's our agent. We'd say, who knew? We're about to kill him. Want us to or not? And so, this, this old protection of information had to be changed completely, and that was a huge cultural change. And so the, one of the ways we did it was, when I took over, we had this daily video teleconference with the two headquarters coordinated, the rear headquarters at Fort Bragg and the Ford headquarters at uh, Baghdad, where I was. And we changed it, and we opened it to everybody. So we went from 50 people a day to 7,500 people. We went from 30 minutes to 90 minutes every day for the five years I commanded, and they continued after. And you say, that's madness. Getting everybody on one big video teleconference, and do, it's just ridiculous. It was the most efficient and effective thing we did. Everybody got this understanding of what the situation was. It was this conversation across the command structure. Anybody could talk, anybody could ask a question. We ran these chat rooms parallel to the 
the actual video teleconference so you could reach out, hey, I just heard you say this, can I come see you, that sort of thing. And we developed lateral connections which we'd never had before between organizations. And so suddenly everybody knows what we are trying to do, not what they are trying to do. Everybody knows they have to be aligned on the big mission because that's the only one that matters. And then inside that, it started to increase a different sense of things because at the beginning of the war, we had certain assets that were very limited, helicopters and unmanned aerial vehicles. And so you would apportion them to somebody based on prioritization. But that wasn't very effective because they might use it once that night. But actually, those assets could do more in a night than that. So we just changed it and created this marketplace. We'd give the assets to the highest priority element. But then other people would reach out and say, if you're going to use them between 9 and 11, can I use them at 11.30 to 1.30 in the morning? And the person who got them goes, sure. Why does he do that? Because the next night, he may need to ask somebody. So you create a culture that says, I'm going to share because it's in my interest. And we started, instead of getting a very limited use utility out of them, we started using them constantly. But it was all done, not at my level, it was done down at a very low level. Because we learned that when you give everybody shared consciousness, you can push down decision making really low because now, now they have the big picture. Because the danger before is you don't want to empower people if they don't know the big picture, they might do something incorrect. But we were able to push it to an extraordinary level. Those, when we started, and I talked about four operations, I approved every one when we started. When we were at 300 raids a month, I was approving none. It had all been pushed, not just one level, but several levels down. They must it, have put their chests out when they had to realize that uh, you were giving them that authority. Well, you know, they, they took ownership. Yeah. That was the difference. They now owned the outcome, and, and it was just extraordinary how well they did with it. And you talked about uh, outcome there. In all, pretty much all of your speeches that I've watched, you mentioned winning probably about 30 times, yeah. right? And process, you say process becomes more important than outcome. Um, how do you stop organizations from, from doing that? Yeah, it's, it's so easy to fall into because sometimes you, you break organizations into functions. You say, be really good at this. And they get really good at it. And it's like working your, your body if you work certain muscles too much, it can actually put you out of balance with other things and cause you problems. And, and yet, you don't want to tell a muscle not to work. And so as a consequence, you've got these different parts of the organization that are optimizing internally. And they're typically incentivized for it. If they are incentivized to do X, how well they do it, they're going to do that because that's either incentives with money or incentives with intrinsic things which are less uh, direct but, but more powerful. And so you've got to break down the incentives, and you've got to break down people's sense of it. Everybody's got to understand what the outcome is, that the shared outcome is. And because they're good people, I didn't run into anybody trying to screw it up. Yeah. Everyone I, I ran into was brave, courageous, competent, wanted to do a good job. But they're pulling in a different direction because they didn't know or they hadn't been reminded to be aligned. Yeah. On that point, um we haven't discussed communications that much, but uh, you, you, when you were, went to places, you were known for visiting, um, sometimes unannounced. It says, you asked the question, if I told you, and you speak to anyone in the organization, not the top folk, if I told you that we weren't going to go home until we win, what would you do differently? I think that's a fantastic. Yeah, thing. actually, I would do, I'd look at the person, I'd say, if I told you, you're not going to go home until we win, <laughs> what would you do differently? And of course, young sergeant looks at me, and typically they, they laugh nervously. And then they're thinking, can this guy do that? <laughs> um, and, and I'd look at them like that, and then they'd go, and they'd typically get very thoughtful for a second, and they'd go, sir, I'd do a lot differently. And I said, well, okay, then why are we not doing that? Because winning is what matters, even if you go home, you know, and we replace somebody, we've got to be focused on that. And typically, they took a much longer-term view. They said, and this is Afghanistan, people are saying, okay, we're not going to win by doing this. We've really got to build confidence in relationships and this kind of thing. And... Uh, you could pull out of them just extraordinary vision, but sometimes you have to unlock it with a question. Taking everything that you've learned in your career so far and everything in the book and in your, in your psyche, how would you use that in contemporary times to win against yeah. IS? People say, well, we got to go bomb ISIS or we got to go boots on the ground or, or whatnot. And I would say, that's fine. You know, maybe we got to do that. But if we don't have a blueprint, for the house we're trying to build. It doesn't make sense to be digging holes for a foundation or cutting wood for, to start building because 
It's just you don't know what you're doing, and people aren't bought into it. And so what happens is I'm afraid we're at a point right now where we're doing gestures of response. You know, we're, we did this. The United States did this after 9-11. I mean, we absolutely um, fell right into what Osama bin Laden wanted us to do. I don't know if anybody has read his stated, written uh, plan, strategy. His plan was to strike the United States in a way that would cause us to spasmodically react and overreact. And in so doing, we would alienate the Muslim world and we would bankrupt ourselves. It's pretty close. He knew that if he could get us to overreact, that he would, he would come out ahead. Now, I think we came at it, and it wasn't perfect, because obviously as we struck him, I think we were more effective uh, than he expected. But at the end of the day, um, if you're going after ISIS, you better stop and say, OK, what are we trying to do here? Because bombing, you're not going to kill them all. And even boots on the ground are going to get an antibody-like response in the region, and pretty soon foreign troops are going to be an issue there. But even more basically, if you haven't built a blueprint for what you think that region looks like afterward, the reason ISIS exists is because the region is collapsing politically. And so it has the opportunity to be grow like weeds in the uh, cracks in the sidewalk. So if we don't look at what's causing ISIS to, to get this disproportionate level of influence and effectiveness, and we don't develop a blueprint and then show it to everybody, show it to everybody in the region, argue over it, you know, et cetera. Because if people don't have an idea, this is where we're going, then everybody's going to fight for where they want to go. And we're going to be pulling in a different direction. We see that now. The Turks shot down a Russian plane. Theoretically, we're all trying to make the region more uh, stable. But it doesn't feel like that, does it? So I would say that I would start with, you, and this is painful. It's easier for me to say than it is for leaders to do. <laughs> but I would pull people in and I'd say, we have got to develop a blueprint that's credible for people. And I'm not going to overreact and do a lot of uh, big muscle movements. I do think ISIS is going to have to be destroyed militarily, at least the manifestation of it right now. But the problem is, in so doing, we need to make sure we don't create more ISIS around the world uh, in how we do that. And because that, that, of course, plays straight into uh, what they want, which is a franchised uh, way to. And this sounds terrible. I don't want to, I don't want to make uh, trivialized terrorism. But one of the things terrorism is designed to do is make life inconvenient. And if they make it inconvenient enough for you, you'll say the hell with it and you'll give in to their demands. And so look at Brussels. That's pretty inconvenient when your city's locked down. But just all of us, we've security and different things that we didn't have before. We've learned to live with it. But the only reason they haven't gotten their demands is because their demands are off the charts. They're just they're un. Uh, fillable. They want to start a caliphate and whatnot. But if they were a more narrow organization that had very limited political demands, they'd probably be getting a pretty sympathetic hearing from a lot of people after all the cost of things that affected people. Well, whoever gets in next into the United States, would they still be u using you? And would you, like, as an advisor, I suppose that's one of your key roles to say we've learned this already. Um, you have to be very careful about retired generals because we all got an opinion and we're no longer responsible. So, you know, whatever we say needs to be sort of discounted. Um, I'm on the advisory board for the CIA and for the D Director of National Intelligence in the United States. So, yeah, um, and which I do, you know, without being paid or anything, just because I think you got to be, you know, you got to be a citizen and a patriot. But, but that's sort of the extent of what I do and would expect to do. General, thank you, sir. We do have uh, microphones, I believe. Do we have microphone handlers? We can have some questions from the floor. Um, you didn't p touch at all upon your personal life in this, and you've obviously got a big personal life and children. Just wondered how that felt for your kids and your wife when you were taking so much risk personally in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah, no, it's a, it's because a, a personal life was really big. I've I've got uh, obviously my wife of now thirty nine years, really close to her. You know, it, it was really, really important. Uh, I was at a different stage of life than young soldiers. Young soldiers with a, a new bride or a young kids or at some stage. I was already a general officer when this started. 
I'd been to the first school for and all, but this was different. This was longer and harder. One of the things that I found that was worth paying attention, I didn't see my son more than, I don't know, six or eight times in, in six or seven years. Um, he was in college. I didn't come home much, and I'd come home for very short periods. And I actually didn't see my wife very much either because I would come back um, for, again, conferences and things like that, maybe once every three or four months for you know, a very short period of time. And when you're, when you're separated for a long time, there are two things that are happening. First off, they're living a life. My wife in the, in the U.S. military, the spouse in the command is very responsible for the families in the command. We don't pay them, but we expect commanders' wives and sergeants' majors' wives to do this amazing level of responsibility. So my wife is responsible for this command that's at war for the five years I commanded it. She's, we're sending home bodies, we're sending home wounded, because we didn't come home with them, we, we sent them home. So she and the wives are, are literally back there uh, dealing with this. Plus they're dealing with everything in life, you know, car breaks, the, all those things. Uh, and so they're, and, and, and your ability to support them when you're forward, because when you're in the war, you think it's all about me. I'm in the war, I'm the hero, everybody's got to be worried about me. But actually, I could argue that the families had a tougher road to hoe uh, than we did. And so it was very important to to try to remember that. Again, we were older, and my wife and I, you know, been mature or been to, uh, through similar things before, but she had a real stress. And as you go to visit wounded, that was really hard. This was also an age when you don't write letters anymore. You write email, and every soldier has a cell phone. So every soldier can call home before the operation. And that's security-wise, it used to be an issue but it's even more so you call home. You want a soldier totally focused on something and suddenly hears that his daughter's got a cold. Those things, they become major challenges. And same thing when the, when the husband calls home and, and hints to his wife he's going on an operation. Now, she's not just worried in general, she's worried in sp specific short term. So in many ways, it makes it harder. And then you're watching on TV. My wife is watching on TV, and everybody's wives are watching on TV. They know when the fighting's going up and down. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. I was, uh, it, it's different, and in some ways, I think it's harder. I was standing next to my deputy commanding general one night, a, a special forces at the time, two-star general, been around a lot. And we're watching on this screen, and we're watching a firefight you know, ongoing firefight between a platoon of an 82nd Airborne Infantry Battalion that was attached to us and Al-Qaeda, it's in Iraq. And we're watching this fight. You, you're watching from above and you see the winks of bullets, or uh, gun muzzle flashes and whatnot. And in the middle of it, I'm talking to him and I said, John, his son was in that battalion. And I said, how's your son? He goes, sir, he's good. I said, where is he? Because this was just one platoon of the battalion. And he pointed at the screen and he says, he's leading that platoon. Can you imagine watching your son in real time in a firefight? I can't. Mm. I mean, I just, mm. you can't do anything for him. You can't help, it's him. And, and I just watched him and I said, wow, we are in a different age and, and it takes a lot family-wise. Yeah. Sorry, I'm gonna be a bit selfish and ask two questions yeah. if I can. The, the one thing I'm reflecting on in listening to you, which it's great to listen to this, is your humility. And I'm reflecting on your humility and your life experiences in comparison to general business leaders and how they approach this. And I'm wondering, if you'd not had a military career, and you'd not seen the situations you just articulated so eloquently, do you think you'd have that humility? Is that innate or is it grown? I think it's a maturity thing as well, but I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um that's a great question. My father was a uh, major general, but he was one of the most humble people you ever met. Very low key, never bombastic. You know, I mean, so part of it, I think, was watching. He was a leader I most admired, and so when we talk about self discipline, I used that he's one of the models. I would say, did I do it like my father would have done it? Um, so I guess that's one. I think also. Uh, Although you see movies and all, there's a certain appetite for this bombastic leadership and military leaders, the patents and whatnot. 
and it plays in short term with soldiers, but in the long term, it, it wears thin real quickly. And so as you watch that, um, uh, you kind of recoil from it. And I think that maturity, it reinforced that in me, don't be that. And I had a couple of commanders that, that were like that, and I just desperately didn't want to be that. So I think those were the things. And then the great course, the other great way to maintain your humility is get married. <laughs> you know, and I said I was going to be selfish and ask a second question because I've got the mic. Um, I'm from EY. We're working a lot with informer and leaders in, and one of the things we talk about a lot is purpose-led transformation yeah. rather than just this kind of cliche of another transformation is coming. And again, I reflected on your observations around that consciousness. And I'm wondering, does that, is that the same sort of thing that we're talking about and what we're starting to see is organisations that are going to be successful in the future, I think, are defining a purpose, sharing that purpose, and then empowering teams to deliver it. Yeah. Um, they're not, in, in my mind, they're not exactly the same, but they overlap. So we would say there are four things you need for an organization to really be effective. The first are two are trust and common purpose, trust between the members of the team or the small teams, hence team of teams. And the other is common purpose, and that's understanding what you're all trying to do, the sense that we are all about the same things. Part of that's values, but part of it is, okay, common purpose, objective. Most small teams have that organically. Good small teams, it just is there. You don't have to create it. You're around a table every day. You're finishing each other's sentences. It's there. When you scale, suddenly you get more than about 150 people. You don't know everybody. And you break into smaller teams just for organization sake. It just happens. Then the two things that I mentioned are shared consciousness and empowered execution. In a tiny team of five or six people, you have shared consciousness because you're just interacting all the time. In a big organization, shared consciousness takes work. It takes real effort. And we think of, you know, an epistle from the C-suite once a month on email will keep everybody. That's just not going to get there. Things are too fast and complex. So this shared consciousness, in, in my argument, argument, is the hardest thing to achieve in a big organization, but the most important. Because if you get the shared consciousness right, the trust and common purpose can be revved up outside the small groups. And if you get the, con the shared consciousness right, then you can empower execution to subordinates. But if you don't give them the, the contextual understanding, delegate an authority and responsibility is someone's unfair because they don't have all the tools to make the kinds of decisions that, that they should. Um, but if you do it, then you can do it uh, very comfortably. I think we're pretty much aligned. Um, hi, I was fascinated by the change in approach when the 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, and you're out there saying you have to tackle things differently. The problem with, well, not problem, the army recruits from below and you train people up. If you think that the game's changed and you need different skills, how do you get them? Because you can't suddenly hire someone in from uh, somewhere else overnight. You've got to do it. What was, the, what was it that you did? Did you just find people who were aligned and put yeah. them in the right positions or retrain your existing people or what? That is a really good point. I'll tell you what we did and then I'll tell you what I think we ought to do. The first is what we did inside our organization is we had had this sort of class structure inside JSOC and the shooters, the guys who go through the door, had big biceps, big knuckles. They're the, the top. And it went down, and intelligence people and support people, they're kind of lesser beings. Um, we found that your value to the organization was no longer aligned with that hierarchy because actually those shooter things were commodities. You, you could train people to do that pretty easily. It was hard to train people to build teams. People could go in and deal with other kinds of organizations come with new ideas, innovate new ways. They tended to be through the organization, but not. So we tended to identify those and start putting them in the key spots, which didn't happen in our old structure. We also, JSOC was able to bring in people from the intelligence community, like the CIA, the NSA. We brought them in laterally, enriched our structure, so we were actually less than half military, uniformed military. We had 60-year-old guys and 21-year-old women, and we had civilians all through this that we were able to bring in. But even that isn't, that was a, a fix to the problem then. 
The challenge in the military now, and I think you hit a key point, this is one of the things I've, I've uh, told people, the military is like a guild in the US Army and pretty much the British Army. You must enter at the bottom. You must matriculate your way through up. You learn some great things there, but the problem is you become part of that organization culturally and you're limited in your, your scope. Even if we send you out, the Army sent me to Harvard for a year and then they sent me to Council on Foreign Relations. But the reality was I'm still kind of this guy until I have this transformational experience. I think what the military needs to do now is have a different model. It's not that hard to learn how to be a soldier. You know, we could put a uniform on you, and I guarantee in a month you'd be in an organization nobody know that you hadn't grown up there. Um, and yet you could bring new ideas, new innovation, new things, and I think we need a lateral entry at every level to include general officer. Now, the people who will resist that is the military, because if they're in the guild, we don't want those outsiders coming in and doing it. So, you know, now I'm retired. They don't love me saying this, but I'd say the guild has got to go away. It's got to be purpose constructed. You know, you tailor for purpose all the time, which means the talent you need. It's just not that hard to learn how to be a soldier. Now, some people could stay their whole life, but I really would have a much more open model, plus a very aggressive model to go out and find really big talent and say, We've been, we, we know you're really good at this. We want you to serve three years in the military. You're going to come in as a colonel. Most people would say, OK. Three years, good, and I, then I'm, I'll come back out. And some, of course, would want to stay, but I, th I think you could do that for every rank. In the business world, you can either grow your own or you headhunt, but you can't really headhunt from the Pakistani army, can you? No. If you suddenly find somebody really good there, it was the Third World War. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Thanks for oh, being thanks here. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to take you to US politics for a second, if you don't mind. If we look at the election that's coming yeah. up, and we look at the changing kind of threat landscape around the world, yeah. What are the qualities that you think the next leader in the U.S. needs to have that perhaps contrast to the current leadership there? Yeah. And in many cases, the current candidates as well. Um, I think that the next leader is going to have to be a strong person, but really going to have to be a, I don't, this sounds cheap, but a deal maker. We need somebody who builds linkages with people. We, we need somebody who develops relationships who, who's one of those people that almost the art of the compromise brings different people together, works that deal, and, and makes, uh, makes the gears work. I am less interested in having a strong ideologue or even a very inflexible person who you know, won't blow in the breeze because the reality is in the world we're in, I think the person shouldn't have to compromise values but we should compromise damn near everything else. Inside our internal politics, as you know, we don't do any of that now. And as a consequence, we get no deals, which is just disastrous. And I think internationally what's happened is, to a degree, the United States has an essential position of leadership and it must fill that. There's just no other uh, uh, alternative. But we've also got to be a coalition builder. We've got to be the people who are pulling people in and, and making it possible. Sometimes we do it too often, we don't. And so what I'd be looking at a leader is that. Um, mm. But that doesn't play well in the, in the very partisan politics of the United States right now. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking of the sort of empathetic coalition builder, Donald yeah. Trump really fills the bill, I thought, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Just one thing I forgot to ask you, just uh, ending up on a sort of a personal note, uh, Stanley, if I can. Um, I don't know if it's an urban myth, but I've been told you sleep uh, four hours a day, you have one meal a day, and you work out like a crazy guy. Is that, is that true? I, I eat one meal a day, and I work out a lot. I sleep now as much as I can. Okay, <laughs> catching up. Uh, I don't naturally stay asleep as long, but, you know, uh, you know I'll, I'd sleep 12 hours if I could stay asleep. But, but in the war, it was a four-hour cycle, and it just... It, and I've been doing the one meal a day since I was a lieutenant. That's just a habit. That's right. not some Zen thing. Okay. It's but it's a big, thing. ugly meal. Is it? Like yeah. th three chickens in a cow? It's, yeah, it's whatever I can reach. <laughs> so don't go to dinner with me because I'll be eyeing your plate. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of all of us here, I just want to say, General Stanley McChrystal, it's been an honor hearing from you, meeting you, and thank you very much indeed for your time, sir. Can I do one more thing? Yes, sir. I recognize two of my colleagues, and I've got Brigadier General retired Dave Gillian. 
who works in McChrystal Group. He was my deputy for intelligence in Afghanistan with me, extraordinary soldier. And then I've also got Teddy Collins, who is one of the four authors of the book Team of Teams. And truth be known, he was the smart guy. <laughs> we took three ex-military guys, and I found my best student at Yale um, in, in the six years I've taught there and asked him if he'd come spend 15 months and help us write a book. And so the, the real brains behind this are, are right there. So if you get a chance to talk to them, we would. And I didn't realize Cheryl Ann was in the back. And my exec assistant's here, Cheryl Ann Anderson, with me. And she spent 25 years in the Army, became a master sergeant. And then she worked in the Pentagon. And then I asked her to come out and join me for this adventure. And she did that. So I, I want to thank her publicly. Thanks.